Thanks for tuning in to Ancient Greece Declassified. Episode 10 Hannibal Takes on Rome. Can one person single handedly alter the course of history? Or think of it this way. If you were to go back in time and remove one of these towering figures like Genghis Khan or Joan of Arc or Gandhi, would history look completely different? Or would the greater societal and geopolitical forces at work move things along much the same lines anyway? The extent to which one individual can shape history is an issue that has been debated by historians as long as there have been historians. But whatever your own view on the matter, it's hard to deny that the protagonist of today's episode seems to have held in his hands, at least for a moment, the destiny of many nations. His name was Hannibal, and unlike his fictional namesake, he was no cannibal. He was a general from the Republic of Carthage on the northern coast of Africa, and for a few years, in and around 216 BC, he came so close to toppling the seemingly unstoppable power of Rome that he's been a fascination to students of history ever since. Now, you may be wondering why we're discussing Hannibal taking on Rome on a podcast about ancient Greece, and it's not just because our main source for this conflict is a Greek historian named Polybius, or that Hannibal himself was educated in Greek, it's because... As astute observers of the conflict at the time realized, the outcome of this clash between Rome and Carthage would determine the fate of the entire Mediterranean. The Mediterranean at this time, in the 3rd century BC, was unrecognizable compared to what it had been in the previous century. This was no longer a world of thousands of city-states. Now there were five or six superpowers calling all the shots. In the east, there were the large Hellenistic kingdoms ruled by the successors of Alexander the Great, and in the west, you had Rome and Carthage. Unlike the Hellenistic kingdoms, in which monarchs often struggle to maintain control over their vast territories, Carthage and Rome were energetic and enterprising republics, always expanding. And since they were so close to each other, their rapid expansion meant that they were pretty much locked on a collision course with one another. Sure enough, war broke out in 264 BC, called the First Punic War, because the Romans called the Carthaginians Puniki, and it lasted 23 years. This was a struggle of epic proportions. I mean, the casualties alone on each side were more than double the size of Alexander the Great's entire army. Take a moment to process that. And this was only the first of three Punic Wars. These two republics could seemingly put out so much manpower in the field, battle after battle, catastrophe after catastrophe, they seemed so inexhaustible. You can see why it was becoming apparent that the winner of this conflict would become the top dog in the Mediterranean. Rome dealt Carthage a crushing defeat in the First Punic War. The Romans expelled the Carthaginians from Sicily, and soon after wrested control of Sardinia and Corsica from them as well, thus depriving Carthage of most of its overseas possessions. It would have been very difficult at that point to imagine that Carthage had any chance of making a comeback. But here's where Hannibal comes in. He goes to Spain, where the Carthaginians are busy colonizing the area, trying to make up for their losses in Sicily and Sardinia by acquiring new colonial sources of income. And then Hannibal does something that the Romans would have never imagined possible. He gathers an army, including dozens of war elephants, and he leads them from Spain all the way across what's now France to the Alps north of Italy and crosses this formidable mountain range in the winter under extremely harsh conditions, elephants and all, and comes down into Italy. Just imagine the shock of the Romans when they saw an army and elephants coming down the mountains. The Romans quickly scramble their armies to stop him, but Hannibal obliterates them, dealing blow after devastating blow to the Romans. He then spends 16 years campaigning on the Italian peninsula, undefeated, trying to get the other Italians to join him against Rome. And there were moments when the Romans really thought that they were finished. But ultimately, 
Rome's allies stayed loyal and the city of Rome itself was unassailable. Eventually, Hannibal met his match in the Roman general Publius Scipio. While Hannibal was doing his thing in Italy, Scipio goes to Africa and attacks Hannibal's home base, forcing Hannibal to abandon Italy, rush back to Carthage, and try to save his city. Hannibal is finally defeated by Scipio at the Battle of Zama, near Carthage in 202 BC, and thus ends the Second Punic War. Our two main sources for these events are the historians Polybius, writing about 16 years later, and Livy, writing about two centuries after the fact. Livy's account has more literary polish, but Polybius was more of an adventurer and an empiricist. When he wanted to see what Hannibal's trek across the Alps was like, he went and climbed the Alps. Our guest today is a historian more along the lines of the Polybian model. Patrick Hunt is the type of archaeologist who has broken his bones digging for ancient stones. And he has led expeditions across over 25 alpine passes in search of the route that Hannibal took. A prolific author, Hunt is based at Stanford University, where he directed the Stanford Alpine Archaeology Project for 18 years. He also works for National Geographic, and his latest book, out next month, is called Hannibal. Patrick Hunt, welcome to Ancient Greece Declassified. Thank you. I'm thrilled to be here. So I'm just curious, how many bones have you actually broken in your adventures in the Alps looking for Hannibal's footsteps? Probably uh, 40 episodes, 40 bones. Some of them have been rebroken a few times. Wow. So what? why the fascination with Hannibal and this trek across the Alps? Like, when did you become interested in Hannibal? Every schoolboy hears about Hannibal taking elephants and an army over the Alps. But it wasn't until I began working in the Alps that uh, almost every village I was in, regardless of which pass, said, Hannibal passed through here, and I knew that couldn't be true. So Hannibal was the culmination of work in Roman archaeology, Celtic archaeology, and Phoenician archaeology studies. It was the perfect nexus for all three. So this is a moment in history when the fate of many civilizations kind of coincides in one man's mission. Yes partly because of the competing mindsets of the Romans. Uh, A peninsular culture locked into Italy, but an agrarian economy needing expansion, constantly needing new land, versus a mercantile economy, which was not so interested in land, but ports, emporia, places to both bring goods in and get raw material out. Those two competing interests coalesced into that great moment that we call the Punic Wars. And in the Second Punic War, which is the Hannibalic War, Carthage was already deprived of its main island possessions in Sicily and Sardinia, and they were kind of blocked off from any way of attacking Rome except by going all the way around Europe and down through the Alps. So... How surprised were the Romans when they saw elephants coming down the mountains in the north? It's fascinating to speculate. Uh, Since the Romans were flatlanders, they thought the wall of Italy protected them, as uh, Polybius and Livy suggest in Hannibal's speech before his men, if in fact that story is true. Hannibal had something, though, that they weren't accounting and that is because of his name, Hannibal, the grace or favor of Baal. Baal's a storm god, a mountain god, a god used to throwing thunderbolts in high places. I think Hannibal was predisposed to going over the Alps because since the coastal route was blocked, the mountains were less a formidable obstacle to him because he probably thought his god was on his side. And the coastal route was blocked by, if I'm not mistaken, Massalia or Marseille, which was already a firmly entrenched Roman ally at this point. Is that correct? Yes, and uh, Roman armies on the other side in the Po Valley. So the Alps form really just a giant wall 
that blocks all of Italy from the rest of Europe. And you have these tiny coastal, like I guess, beaches where you can get around them. But other than that, it's a pretty formidable wall. So how did Hannibal decide which route to take? Fortunately, as Polybius tells us, he had guides. And the Celts had gone through the Alps on multiple occasions. Uh, there had been migrations of Celts and troop movements of Celts over different passes. Some of those passes uh, have Celtic pathways in them uh, going back easily into uh, the late Iron Age. So Hannibal went over a pass where the Celts had already made a pathway, and those were his scouts. He had many different Celtic groups, but the ones who were calling to him the most strongly were the Boii from Bononia, modern-day Bologna. But he had other Celtic groups too, and they met uh, somewhere in Gaul, southern Gaul, somewhere around Langu in the Languedoc area today, and uh, inveigled him to bring it on. And he was able to get Celtic support because northern Italy was still quite Celtic at this time, and they had been pulled under Roman dominion, but they were not very happy about that. So they were quite pleased to find this uh, formidable ally coming out of nowhere and helping them cast aside the Roman yoke. Yes, the Romans were grabbing farmland left and right. And while they may not have been doing centuration yet, they were definitely building colonies, Placentia, Cremona, uh, and others. Uh, Ariminum, they were definitely involved in taking what was Celtic land and bringing it under the Roman sway. Perhaps what makes Hannibal's trek over the Alps so impressive and so unexpected is the fact that he did it in winter. Was that time period chosen for the surprise value? I think that there were many delays on his way through Gaul. The passage of the Rhone took quite a few days. Uh, moving up along the Rhone and wherever he went from there, the Acer or whichever river. Uh, before he knew it, uh, September was over. And even though it was good to come when the waters were low, since there hadn't been much snow runoff in the autumn, most of it had already occurred. Nonetheless, Hannibal probably didn't expect to come in the winter but he was ambushed several times by the Gauls as well, and he had punitive measures against them. I think the winter, in this case, since winter arrives early at high altitude, late October, early November, the snow is just beginning to stick. But Hannibal went over a pass that already had previous snow from the winter before still in place, whether in traces, vestigial, or whatever. There was enough snow around, and the altitude meant that he had to go up at least 8,000 feet in elevation to get to that place where there would still be snow from the previous winter, plus hypoxic, low oxygen, uh, hypothermic, cold temperatures. The men were, uh, if not wounded, under duress, probably not prepared for these conditions. So it really was uh, quite an intrepid trek. So although he had support from several Celtic tribes. The Celts were a people of many different tribes, and there were some that, as you said, ambushed him. So he had some difficulties, and the delay caused more difficulties from the weather. So how much of his army actually survived the passage over the Alps? As far as we can tell, Hannibal seems to have lost, along with many pack animals and food supplies, up to 40% of his actual army. That would be a huge, huge loss. That kind of dent in your army would be unacceptable under today's terms uh, to lose almost half your army. So what were the numbers before and after? On the west side of Gaul, if he had uh, 45 to 50,000 men, by the time he crosses the Alps, he's left with maybe 25 or 30,000. So he's lost 40% of his forces. Wow, and yet he persevered and went undefeated for over 15 years up and down Italy just on a rampage. And that's because to make up for the loss of his veterans, his multicultural army, 
He augmented that with Celts. Many of the allied Celts came over to him in Italy, and he then uh, tried to bring all of South Italy away from the pack and the allied Roman force to his side. And sometimes he succeeded, but overall he did not. We'll get into Hannibal's attempt at forming alliances on the peninsula in a second, but in your investigations in the Alps, looking for his route, did you have any uh, eureka moment or any exciting day that stands out among all your many, many trips through the mountain range? I think using Polybius as a primary source, when you extrapolate from Polybius 10 or 11 criteria that Hannibal's pass must fulfill, for me, it wouldn't be in a one Eureka, but the accumulation of traveling over 35 passes and finding, finally, one pass that meets all the criteria. And have you found that pass? We think we have, but the problems are that there could as yet be an unnamed pass or unknown pass that could also fulfill all the criteria. There was an article several months back about uh, elephant dung discovered in the Alps, and they thought maybe this is uh, you know, the first sure piece of evidence of Hannibal's crossing. What do you think of that? Is that a... I would prefer to let Tom Holland answer that, uh, because he said it's just a bunch of... And then he used S <laughs> asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. A bunch of beep? Yes. And that could have been actually, that need not be Hannibal's elephants, that could have been his brother Hasdrubal's elephants who came over later on. So far, the only bacterial element that would even convey uh, uh, mammals was a Clostridium uh, bacterium that is associated with horses. There's no elephant dung. Okay. It's horse dung. <laughs> or some other... Uh, so, sort of, it could be a ruminant animal dung too, but most likely uh, horse dung. Okay. So Polybius is perhaps our most reliable source for the crossing of the Alps. We also have Livy, who gives a very gripping account of Hannibal's expedition. Are there any other sources that have equal weight to those two, or are those the main pillars? Well, we know that Hannibal had with him Tudor and Amanuenses, like Sosilos. Most of the other data we have is after the fact, considerably. Arian, for example, considerably after the fact, even later than what we would, would hope for uh, with Livy's cribbing from Polybius. Uh, others, uh, Frontinus in his Strategimata, put a lot of anecdotal information together, uh, but each has a different emphasis. Uh, Frontinus for stratagems, Arian, for his Hannibalic wars, but Polybius is still tops because he's closest to the date and also is the only historian we know who we can verify to some degree always wrote about places he knew from firsthand experience, or in this case, he traveled the path by foot himself. The accounts given of Hannibal as a person in Polybius and in Livy, one Greek source, one Roman source, could not be more different. Livy portrays Hannibal as a cruel, sadistic, murderous, evil person, basically. And Polybius is more diplomatic, let's say. On the one hand, he's the client of the younger Scipio, so he is writing from a Roman perspective. On the other hand, he says of Hannibal's character, he says, quote, some regard him as having been extraordinarily cruel, some exceedingly grasping of money. But to speak to the truth of him or of any person engaged in public affairs is not easy. So why the disparity in the accounts? Well, Livy, for one, uh, who constantly looks for every time he can to harp on Hannibal's perfidy, punicifetus or whatever, Livy is, of course, a Roman and makes a little attempt to hide his bias. Uh, to the victor go the spoils. H Livy writes from the point of view 
uh, after all the Punic Wars are done, after Rome is consolidated into an empire. Polybius is still on the front end before there's an empire. And Polybius, being Greek, is also a little more neutral. Uh, Polybius tends, time and again, to follow the Greek historical model of Thucydides and even Herodotus of attempting for objectivity. When you praise your enemies, it lends a, a certain aura of objectivity to it. And I think Polybius may have those models in mind, the Herodotian and Thucydidean models. And this goes back to Homer, the idea of ennobling the enemy in order to uh, make the victory even grander. Exactly. But the interesting thing is that this disparity of opinions on Hannibal persists to this day. Um, outsiders of academic history departments may be surprised to know that most academic classicists and ancient historians are on team Scipio pretty securely, whereas many amateurs or outsiders to ancient history, famously Freud, for example, have considered Hannibal an inspirational figure. So why has this disparity and strong feeling for or against Hannibal, why has that persisted, do you think? It's partly encumbered by the fact that we have so little Punic documentation. The Romans seemingly either assimilated uh, and then either destroyed the originals. We don't know necessarily what the Phoenicians, or in this case, the Carthaginians, really thought of Rome. Only one side has survived. And it's that the winner rewrites history as well. On top of that, uh, the Romans have been considered as a model for, in some ways, even American government and uh, sort of quasi-imperial ambitions, so that Rome stands with this imperial eagle over time and place. And Carthage lost everything. And of course, you also have Diodorus Siculus and even biblical accounts uh, uh, describing the cruel and horrible Phoenician and Punic religion, uh, you know, infanticide and things like that. So Carthage doesn't look very good overall, and they're considered to be a mercenary culture, whereas Rome was also fighting for the fatherland. So many, many things combine to give us this picture of a perfidious Carthage and a, a noble sort of pater patriae story of Rome, the fatherland. Modern accounts of, as you said, uh, Carthaginian religion being horrible because of some evidence for human sacrifice, those portrayals of Carthage are somewhat ironic, though, when we overlook the fact that the Romans were, you know, putting people in the arena to fight each other to the death for the amusement of their entire citizenry. So there, there were things happening on both sides that we find morally repugnant. Absolutely. <clears throat> and it's also ironic, as you point out, that the sort of two founding moments in the history of Rome, the founding of Rome itself, uh, sadly, the rape of the Sabine women, and the founding of the Republic of Rome, the rape of Lucretia. These are violent moments in Rome's history. And whether or not we ever identify with vicarious spectatorial events, Rome was equally tarnished by its own history. Hannibal had with him no less than two Greek tutors slash historians, Socilus of Sparta and Silenus of Sicily, both of whom uh, supposedly wrote accounts of his campaign. How badly would you like to have those accounts? And like, do you think those would fundamentally alter our picture of the events? It's so exciting to think about ever discovering fragments, but the sad fact is so little of the past remains. When you think of the over 800 authors we know of from antiquity, and we may have only 10% of that, it's tempting to want to ask for other documentation of Hannibal. And while we're, I think, safe to say 
that at least one or the other, Polybius and Livy, probably used some of those accounts uh, for their own histories. As far as we can say, no fragments have survived even in them. They don't credit either of them with any passages in their history. So uh, it's a, a tempting but unfortunate fact of history, how little remains. If you came upon a genie who offered to swap Livy's books on Hannibal with Socilis's accounts, would you would you lose Livy forever to gain Socilis? No, I actually love Livy too uh, for his color and his drama. Uh, I recognize he's not very good on geography, but uh, the danger of a genie, of course, is there's always a backslash indemnity that you have to pay. So. I think I'll be okay with Livy surviving. So Hannibal invades Italy and for 16 years goes around Italy undefeated, delivers several crushing defeats to the Romans. Then the Romans realize that they should stop fighting him in these big battles and they just kind of, they start their delay tactics. And all these Greek cities and other formerly independent cities around Italy that have recently come under Roman dominion, they don't go over with Hannibal. Hannibal's hoping that they will go over, right? He tries his best to get the Greek states to come over on his side, to get the other cities to get on his side. But one of the most amazing things about that story is the fact that they didn't go over. So what kept all these states that, according to Polybius, felt a lot of bitterness to Rome, what kept them from coming over to Hannibal's side? One of the fascinations about right after the Battle of Cannae in 216. Much of South Italy did indeed go over, but not necessarily happily, fearing reprisals from Rome. The big plum, Neapolis, Naples, maintained its independence. Uh, others, Nola as well. A couple went back and forth, Capua, Taranto. But uh, most of the Greek city-states, while they certainly were not happy about being under the yoke of Rome, considered also the economic benefits of alliance to Rome within the same peninsula. Hannibal is from across the water. The Carthaginians never had a foothold in Italy proper as they did in Sicily. So that fact alone that while the Greek city-states were not exactly always happy fellows with Rome's allies. They were on the same peninsula as Rome, and they certainly knew Rome's manifest destiny of uh, land and uh, assimilation of the total Italian landscape. Hannibal's goal, though, was not to conquer Italy per se. Polybius tells us that he spread the message to the various cities in Italy that he's not there to conquer them. He's there to liberate them from the Roman yoke. On the other hand, this idea of conquering people to liberate them was a tried and tested Roman propaganda tactic. So the Romans had been doing this already. So was Carthage just too late in this game of, uh, let's say, liberation conquering politics? The liberation that Carthage promised was always something that I think Rome's presence in the land always cast a shadow over this. Carthage could liberate, quote unquote, temporarily, uh, but it could only do so with uh, an army of mercenaries and others. Rome had an inexhaustible supply of materials and ultimately legions, and the Allies knew that. The Greeks were fully aware that Hannibal's war was not fully supported by Carthage, and I think they realized that if Hannibal offered liberation, it was probably only temporary. Polybius writes that in all of these Greek cities there was a very small Roman garrison, and it seems that even if the people wanted to revolt against Rome, having just five or six Romans at the top was enough to uh, keep things in order. And uh, there were many times 
when the top echelon, the elites of a city-state or a colony or an ally, had strong connections to Rome in other ways. Uh, intermarriages was one of them, that uh, the top Greek rulers in a city-state had both familial and even uh, agricultural and trade connections to Rome. So these were ways that also insulated the city-states and the Greek colonies and southern Italians from going fully over to Hannibal. They knew they might gain something with Hannibal, but that quasi-independence was not matched by the long-term benefits they would enjoy with Rome. Some historians claim that Hannibal's fatal mistake was not going for Rome directly. When he crossed the Alps, he had a he had a choice to make. Do I go for Rome directly? And the danger of that is that other allied states might attack me while I'm besieging Rome. Or do I march up and down the peninsula displaying great victories and then hope that all the allies come on my side and then Rome has no chance? So he chose the second option. And some historians say that was his fatal flaw and he should have just gone directly for Rome. Do you think that would have made a difference? That's a question that even his lieutenant, the Numidian cavalry general, Mahar Bal, posed to him after Cannae in 216, said, you need to march to Rome. We could be there in under a week. But Hannibal, while he had tried, as you pose, so many times to bring allies over onto his side, including the Etruscans in Etruria, uh, going down through the, uh, uh, the Arno marshes and so on into uh, the area of uh, what had been part of the heart of Etruria, Aretium. Hannibal went around Rome so many times, and yet he had besieged Saguntum in 219. Took him six months to break down a small uh, hilltop fortress of Saguntum. Six months, and Rome was 10 times larger with a berm wall, probably in some places close to 50 miles around the city of Rome, and supplied even with water through the Tiber. So Hannibal knew that a city like Rome would be a much more difficult besiegement than Saguntum. And when he finally got to Rome around 207, and he came close to the wall and saw it, Hannibal realized then that he was probably right all along to not attack Rome. It would be a task that his small armies could never fully surround Rome, the city. And on that day when he did go to Rome, Polybius writes that it just so happened that the very previous day was the day of the draft when all the young men came to military service. And he says, this is one of those moments when you truly see the power of chance over the destiny of armies. When if Hannibal had come two days earlier, he could have prevented all these fresh recruits. He could have caught them in the field on their way to Rome. He could have done all kinds of things, but he came on the, on the worst day of the year. That is one of those uh, moments in history where uh, Hannibal may or may not have known of the levies for raw recruits, uh, but uh, could he have made a difference? Uh, his mobile army, uh, fast as it was, was still mostly on foot. And however long it took him to come from the south, uh, up, no doubt, in some cases along Roman roads, Hannibal, whether he knew or not, uh, that, that indeed, as you mentioned, is a turning point. He said, though, uh, just a, a short while before, after the Battle of Metaurus, when his brother Hasdrubal's head uh, was, uh, if the story is true, th rolled into across the floor of his tent, Hannibal pointed to his brother's head, looking down at the decapitated Hasbro, and said, there lies the fate of Carthage. So the Romans had killed Hasdrubal way up in the north, and they had packaged the head and delivered it hundreds and hundreds of miles just to throw it to Hannibal to send him a message. So goes the story. And the loss of Hasdrubal's army 
possibly, uh, if Livy or Polybius is right, 55,000 Carthaginians and their allies were slaughtered in the fields on the Battle of Mataras, not too far from uh, Ariminum, Rimini today. So that loss of the major reinforcing army Hannibal was hoping to count on made the fate of Hannibal's own invasion of Italy inevitably a failure too. And this reinforcement force was also going over the Alps, but that was at a better time of the year. It wasn't as difficult. So they didn't suffer the same casualties that Hannibal had suffered. Yes. But then they lost the battle with the Romans. Yes. I mean, although Hannibal remained undefeated for 16 years, the longer he you know, kept doing what he was doing, the Romans were very quick to learn what the Carthaginian techniques were and to adopt them. As Polybius says of the Romans, this is one of their strong points, quote, no people are more willing to adopt new customs and to emulate what they see is better done by others. So the Romans realized that one of the strong points of the Carthaginians was their Numidian cavalry. The Numidians were a nomadic people from northern Africa. So what do they do? They bring the war to Africa and they pay the Numidians to come over to their side and start hostilities against Carthage. So Hannibal is called back by the Carthaginians who say, come over here and save us. So how does he escape from Italy at this point? I mean, the Romans must have been blockading the seas, like waiting to catch him, right? So how did he actually finally get out with his soldiers and get back to Carthage to try to save them? Uh, the Romans don't totally control the seas. The Romans may have a mass force around Carthage itself and its port, but Hannibal comes in from the backside with a combined fleet, mostly from South Italy and, and some Carthaginian ships, comes down into the Gulf of Sidra, uh, further east of Carthage. So he's able to slip past the Roman blockade, if there was one, and he finds Carthage in a very bad position. The Romans are there, they've trained the locals, they have the Numidian cavalry on their side, they've already chosen uh, where they want to pitch their camp, where all the, all the water is. Hannibal's forced to camp where there's not much water, his troops are thirsty, and the Carthaginian forces are untrained, uh, just in a bad position. So Hannibal meets Scipio on the battlefield, and Polybius says, quote, the Carthaginians were fighting for their very survival and for the possession of Africa, the Romans for the sovereignty of the world. Yes, and Hannibal has also maybe 80 new elephants that are untrained, thousands of raw recruits that are untrained. In every way, Hannibal's chess match has been anticipated by Scipio. Scipio learned a lot from Hannibal how to choose the right battle site, uh, get there first, reconnoiter. Uh, Hannibal knew in every way that he was finally outmaneuvered. And he tries to negotiate before the battle, but Scipio says, nope, too late, it's time for you to pay. Yes, and there's this famous scene where the two of them are recorded to have met the day before battle. And Hannibal knows already that he cannot win the battle that next day, uh, in which Scipio will be the victor. Uh, but Hannibal, it's well known that after the Battle of Zama, Scipio protected Hannibal, even in Carthage. And uh, when Rome wanted Hannibal, uh, wanted Hannibal's head on a platter, Scipio seems to be the one who, out of great admiration and respect for Hannibal, helps Hannibal avoid the humiliation of going to Rome. So at the battle that ensues, the famous Battle of Zama, Hannibal suffers the first defeat in his life. And Rome, of course, demands huge sacrifices to be made on the part of Carthage, huge indemnities to be paid. And there's another great scene in Polybius where the Carthaginian Senate is meeting, and a lot of guys are saying, that's ridiculous, we're not gonna take these terms. And Hannibal, who, this, who has one eye at this point, he lost one of his eyes in Italy, this one-eyed Hannibal grabs a senator and says, you fools, this is a very lenient set of terms we have to accept, you better say yes, otherwise our entire city will be destroyed. And so Hannibal actually 
persuades the Senate of Carthage to accept the terms. And could that be a reason why Scipio was not after him to bring his head back to Rome? The Gerusia, the Council of Elders at Carthage, was never that friendly to Hannibal to begin with. And whether or not they understand uh, the Iron Fist of Rome, Hannibal certainly understood it. And there is no question that Scipio admired and learned from Hannibal. Uh, I don't think there's a lot that Hannibal could have learned from Scipio, except that, as Polybius says, that Rome's manifest destiny is uh, an empire and to conquer the world. Hannibal saw that too late. The scene in the Carthaginian Senate is particularly powerful because when he grabs the senator's arm and says, accept these terms, everybody gets up and says, it's illegal to grab a senator's arms in the Senate. And Hannibal says, I'm not from here. I grew up in Spain, in Italy. I grew up fighting for you guys in other countries. I've never lived here long enough to know your laws, but I've sacrificed my life for your cause. So that's a particularly, that's a moment where Polybius, I think, gives us a more impressive glimpse into Hannibal's character. Yes. Hannibal's whole life is conditioned by war, not diplomacy. Some say that diplomacy is the art of lying with a smile. Hannibal doesn't seem, on the one hand, incapable of that with his getting into the minds of his enemies. But Hannibal's pretty much a straight shooter. Many years later, we find Hannibal in the East Mediterranean. He's been pushed out of Carthage, understandably, and he has taken refuge in the courts of various Hellenistic kings there, trying to get them to, you know, form an alliance to finally stop Rome. He, he's never going to give up on this mission. And there's this uh, scene in Livy, which Livy says he found in an older Roman author who in turn found it in a Greek author. So there's this kind of telephone game where we don't really know how accurate this is. But the story goes that Scipio meets Hannibal years later in some court of some official in Ephesus in Anatolia. And here you have these two great generals who have fought a battle against each other. And they're meeting again. It's an incredible moment if it's true. And well, what was the dialogue there? Because it's... it's fascinating. When Hannibal and Scipio both meet, uh, near the end of both of their lives, neither of them has been fully appreciated by his country. Both of them, in a sense, die in quasi-exile. So Scipio asks Hannibal, uh, who's the best general in history? Uh, but Hannibal answers Scipio's question, who is the greatest general of all, with Alexander the Great as his first, and comes in pretty quickly next with Pyrrhus, uh, the Pyrrhic victory uh, person, who history has not been so kind to either. If Scipio was wanting himself to be placed in there because he beat Hannibal, Hannibal doesn't give him that gratification. And then Scipio says, and who was third? And Hannibal says, well, I am. And then Scipio says, and if you had beaten me on the field, then what would you place yourself as? And then Hannibal says, well, if I had beaten you, I would be even greater than Alexander. So in a way, he comes around and does pay a compliment. Yes. It's a backhanded compliment by claiming that that would climb the heap. And whether or not the anecdote is true, it's a clever answer. Uh, there's no loss of dignity in any of Hannibal's answers. Finally, though, the Romans decide to hunt Hannibal down, right? And how does he come to an end? Well, the Bithynians finally fall to Roman coin, and the king of Bithynia betrays Hannibal. Hannibal had a fortress at Gebze, uh, which is on the Sea of Marmora, just oh, would be some miles east today of the Bosporus, of Istanbul. And Hannibal had a hilltop fortress with seven entrances, one primary entrance and six that were concealed. And Hannibal suddenly realized it might have been one night, uh, it appears to be uh, evening, and Hannibal suddenly realizes that he only has one 
sort of major domo, one manservant left. Everybody else has fled. So he asks his faithful, trusted one servant to go check all the doors, all the secret entrances. And the person goes out, scouts every other entrance and comes back and says, there's a Roman at every concealed entrance. Wow. So Hannibal knows that there's no escape. It's a Roman soldier waiting at all seven gates. So Hannibal has poison and he commits suicide, takes his own life because he does not want to be dragged back as an old man to be humiliated in Rome. So from a young boy when he swore an oath to his father. Nine years old. That he would never be a friend to Rome. To the moment that he died, he was dedicated to this one goal of stopping Rome's march to world empire. And you said earlier that he didn't realize, or he realized too late, the inevitability of Roman domination of the Mediterranean. So if you could go back in time and meet a young Hannibal, and you had all the knowledge of future events that he didn't have, what would you tell him? I would tell Hannibal, not that it's a lost cause, but that if somehow he could change Rome's mind, uh, since he never tried to destroy Rome, he just wanted Carthage to survive, I would probably tell Hannibal to find a way, if possible, to guarantee the survival of Carthage uh, without it being destroyed. And I wouldn't want Hannibal to change his invasion of Italy because that's what made Hannibal so great. But somehow Hannibal needed to know. I'm not sure I could ever be the one to tell him that, uh, that Rome's march over land, land by land by land, was a fait accompli. Patrick Hunt, thank you very much. Thank you. This concludes our introductory series of 10 episodes that cover roughly 10 centuries, from the late Bronze Age to the supremacy of Rome. If you've listened from the beginning, you have sailed with us the wine-dark sea of history, from the mysterious Bronze Age collapse to the epic tales of Homer and the immortal songs of Sappho, our journey led us to the rise of democracy and theater in Athens, to radical social experiments that were almost terminated during the Persian Wars, and we saw how the unexpected Greek victory in that clash sparked a cultural renaissance that we call the Classical Period. We encountered the new and sometimes dangerous ideas that then emerged, championed by the likes of Socrates and Plato. And we discovered the amazing technological advancements of the Hellenistic period. Finally, we saw today how one man tried to stand up against the tide of history, but ultimately failed to halt the manifest destiny of Rome. From now on, the podcast will continue to explore the ancient Mediterranean, but topic by topic, no longer following a chronological sequence. I want to thank all of you for taking this journey with us. You've been fantastic. And I hope you'll join us next time when we look at what it was like to go to school in ancient Greece and under the Roman Empire. In the meantime, if you're curious to learn more about Hannibal, check out Patrick Hunt's book called Hannibal. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter with the handle at Greece Podcast to stay up to date on upcoming episodes and other news. Leave your comments or contact us directly through the website, greasepodcast.com. Let us know what you thought of this first season. We always love hearing from our listeners. And if you'd like to support the show, please leave us a review on your listening app to help get the word out about the podcast. Thanks for listening to Ancient Greece Declassified. Can you still sing Orpheus and sing something that's going to last? A thousand years slips by so fast, goes off into a dusty myth with you.